remember probably we finished our year with a sermon on the importance of the Word of God. It was the same chapter, chapter 28. We were studying why it is so important for us to, uh, to, have, uh, to pay good attention to the, the Word of God and to see the importance of it in our lives all the time. And then we started the year last Sunday with uh, Vasya's uh, sermon on sanctification, which is another very important aspect of our life that we focus on, on our souls, on our hearts. We have a lot of things going on, and when we start the year, definitely you have a lot of things to be concerned with. You have your dreams, your hopes, you have your expectations, and you have your worries, just looking ahead, looking at the world around us, and many different things that happen in your lives, and, and when we focus on our heart, and thank you, Vasya, last, last Sunday, he helped us to, to focus on the most important thing, that we are in the process of becoming more Christ-like. Today, I would like to make a step farther in the same direction, focusing on one more element in our lives, which I call it's the importance of Jesus Christ for every believer. And we find this message, we find this truth in a very deep and profound way displayed in the book of Isaiah, Actually, through, through all the book of uh, Isaiah, but especially in this passage, chapter 28, and we will read today verses 16 and 17. Let us read them together. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am the one who has laid as a foundation in Zion, sorry, I already preached one sermon, and <clears throat> for some reason my voice <clears throat> just uh, was weaker and weaker and weaker by the end of last sermon, so I will have to, <clears throat> uh, to, to keep some water a little bit just to make sure that I will be able to speak. Behold, I am the one who has laid as a foundation in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. Whoever, is be, whoever believes will not be in haste. And I will make justice the line and righteousness the plumb line. And hail will sweep away the refuge of lies and waters will overwhelm the shelter. Uh, the book of Isaiah, <clears throat> like the rest of the Bible, is pointing us toward Christ. Actually, from the very beginning of the Bible, from chapter 1, if you go farther, you will have all those different pointers that point to Christ. You know that the Bible is about Christ. Christ is the main character of the Bible, Christ is the main purpose. So the Holy Spirit putting together the Bible by different human authors, he was drawing the picture of Christ through different means, different genres, different events in the past, but that's his purpose. He is drawing attention of the Bible reader to the most important need that people have, the need of a Savior. And the book of Isaiah is a primary book of the Old Testament which is focusing on Christ more than any other book. If you remember, we already studied, studied 28 chapters, and if you remember, even in chapter 4, we mentioned that there is a pointer to Christ. And then chapter 7, you remember the famous prophecy about Emmanuel. And then chapter 9 about that miraculous child. And then chapter 11 when he speaks about branch out of the root of Jesse. So we, we see that Isaiah is building up the portrait of the Messiah. He wants us to see Christ. Even he was writing that 700 years prior to Christ being born. But he was... Uh, helping his generation. 
his people to get all those uh, promises that God had promised revealed before him and those new revelations to put together a picture, a general portrait of the Messiah. And now in chapter 28, and we will actually have many more of those passages that we have uh, in, in the book of Isaiah, which speak about Christ, but today this is one special, special passage that I want to draw your attention to. This is a passage about the cornerstone, about the firm stone, about the foundation, sure foundation that God has laid for our sake. A few words about the identity of this stone. You know, rabbinic schools and some liberal the Christian theologians, they have different opinions of what this stone is and what Isaiah is uh, having in mind when he speaks about that. But we actually uh, don't have to wonder about this, uh, this issue because the New Testament, the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, he explains it really well, simple and clear. I will give you just one passage, but there are many different passages that quote Isaiah 28 from different angles. And one of those we find in Romans chapter 9, verses 30 through 33. So Apostle Paul writes about our salvation through Christ, through um, faith by grace when we trust the righteousness of Christ. What shall we say then? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it, that is righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone at as it is written, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the Apostle Paul is writing about salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, and he draws from the, he goes back to the book of Isaiah, and he quotes this passage that we are studying today to, uh, to demonstrate that there are two different ways of salvation, or two different ways how people pursue salvation. There is actually only one way of salvation, but two ways how people try to make it, or try to find it. And he compares one which is trust in your own achievements, and second way, when you trust in God, when you trust in righteousness of Christ here. And he quotes this famous passage about the, uh, the rock of uh, salvation and a uh, rock of offense. We'll focus on this important prophecy by focusing on three most significant aspects of this rock or this stone. First, we see that Isaiah presents it as a cornerstone. So he gives us an idea of a foundation. The Bible gives us many different comparisons. When it speaks about Christian life, it compares to different, different ideas that we could relate to. And one of those ideas is building building which is being built on, on something. And now he describes a foundation. And he says, therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am the one who has laid as a foundation in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone. So it's a very important way how, how Isaiah puts it together and how God expresses it. Look, look, he is emphasizing, he's not just saying about foundation, he is emphasizing himself. Look what he is saying. Behold, I am the one who has laid the foundation in Zion. And there is a reason for that. If you would look up at the very beginning of the, this chapter, verses one through three, Look what we were studying last time when we focused on this passage. He, he was saying, woe to, to the proud, crowd, proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim. And then he describes every 
all the difficult situation where the Israelites were. The, he called them Ephraimites because they were called by the largest uh, tribe of the northern, northern kingdom of Israel. And he is calling them, he, he is using that picture, the proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim. We were describing that last time that those people, they relied on themselves and they, they made themselves a measure, measurements of all their lives and they lived for establishing their own name and they lived for satisfying their own desires. So that was the primary, primary driving force for them, primary direction where, where they were going. And as a result, they came to the point of the radical development of that movement. And that pinnacle is called here the proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim. So whenever people are living for self-pleasing, they will never stop. They will go to the, to the extremes and the more they, they, are, they rely on themselves, more strength and power they have in themselves to the greater excess they go. And then look at verses five and six. And he compares, he speaks about the remnant. So among those people of Israel who lived at that point uh, for themselves, relying on their own power, on their own expertise, on their own knowledge, on their own abilities. So uh, he compares them with the remnant. So there was a small number of people who still were seeking the Lord and relying on him. And look what he is saying here. He is saying, in that day, the Lord of hosts will be a crown of glory and a diadem of beauty to the remnant of his people. Look at the comparisons of two crowns. First crown, where people were relying on themselves, they were living for their own lusts, for their own desires, for their own self-establishment, and they came to the point that he, he looks at them and he's saying, just drunkards of Ephraim, proud crown of drunkards. And later on we read and he's, he's describing the very gross situation where they, they were at that point. And now there is a remnant and that remnant also has a crown. And the crown of the remnant, look, look where or what kind of crown, the Lord of hosts will be the crown. So the God himself, Je Jehovah himself, he became a crown for them. How, how did it happen? Because they were trusting the Lord. And as they were trusting the Lord, they had that cooperation with the Lord. And Lord worked within them and through them, and they were able to produce something which glorifies God. And look how he explains it. He, said, he says about that, will be a crown of glory and a diadem of beauty. So God is producing something real beautiful in the lives of those who trust him. So this is the picture that we see here, which had been created by the prophet in this chapter. And then, as an explanation of how that happens, we come to verse 16. And in verse 16, he explains the way of life of that remnant, that he is calling the rest of the people to join. He is saying in that day, uh, actually, in, um, in verse 16, he is saying, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am the one who has laid a foundation in Zion, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. When we are uh, looking at, uh, at the Old Testament and the ways how God addresses uh, people, uh, his people, uh, primarily, uh, those points. <clears throat> he is always comparing these two different ways. One way is the way of self-confidence, which is bound to lead to shame and defeat. And there is another way, trusting God. And that way will lead to glory, and that those who believe in him 
will not be ashamed. There are several characteristic, important characteristics of the, this stone that we need to point out. The number one characteristic is a foundation. So he speaks about a sure foundation in life. We just started New Year, and it's different when you're looking ahead, you're expecting something. And when you expect something, maybe something uh, concerns you. Maybe there are some dreams that you want to chase. Maybe there are some challenges that you are facing. Maybe there are some things that your mind is occupied with and you are trying to work out how to, how to achieve them, how to solve that problem, how to uh, make sure that we as a family or you as a uh, uh, as a professional or as husband or wife or child or a student that you could achieve. So when we are looking at our lives and we all are driven by our desires, by our purposes, our goals, all of us, we have that. And today it is very important to look at our lives, to look at your life, your own life, through the lens of the foundation. What is your foundation? There's always something that we rely on. Maybe on the stability of political system, so we live expecting that everything will be stable. Or maybe we rely on our professional expertise. You have a lot of experience, you have a lot of knowledge, and you are pretty sure that you will be able to provide for your family next year. Or maybe we rely on our health. We go to gym. Are you still going? It's second week of uh, January. Probably you still go. Uh, it's usually in February when dropouts uh, start. But uh, we, we quite often we rely that everything should work. Like we get up and our heart is beating and we can breathe and our stomach is uh, digesting food and our eyes see and uh, you're here and everything. So we assume a lot of things in our life. And we actually rely on them. And not just that. We rely on our friends, on our partners. We, we assume that our business will be as usual. We assume that we would be able to achieve some things that we, we consider important. But there is actually something that is much more important than all of that I just listed. And that something was very important at that time during Prophet Isaiah, and it is very important, it's still very important today. Isaiah presented two different ways of life. And one way of life was based on the promises of God. God promised something. So the history of the Old Testament, and you understand that the Bible has two-thirds is the Old Testament. And there is a big story, history, prior to coming of Christ. And the reason why that history is there is to explain how God promises his son. He is promising the Messiah to come. And all those people who lived from the very beginning, from Adam and Eve, they, they had two different options for, for life. One option to rely on God's promises, and the other option to rely on their own strength, on their own expertise, on the achievements of civilization on the achievements of other people. And we today are in the very same position, only we are now past Christ's death and resurrection. And we are relying on the same promises, but, but uh, which had been already fulfilled in Christ Jesus. But there is no other ways of making a sure foundation in life. Actually, Apostle Paul stated that very clearly, and uh, it, is, it is not possible to, to go around this very clear statement. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, he is saying, For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Why is that? And I, I, I want to challenge you. Now, when, when you read these words, 
Do you really believe that? Is this something that you experience in your life? That you have for your life Christ as a foundation of your life? You know, one of the greatest problems of churches and religious people is that we read good truth, good principles. We agree with them, but we have no idea what they mean, and we have no idea how they work in our life. And then creates some kind of, you know, double life. From one side, it looks like we are all for the Bible. We, we, of course, of course, we cannot say anything against this good book. But in reality, we never know how it works. So our purpose now is to try to find out what does it mean that Christ is a foundation of your life, you in your practical situation. You're a student, you're a professional, you're a mom, your grandfather, you have your own set of um, problems and challenges and just life issues. So let me look a little bit deeper into that because whatever Bible says, it, it means something. It, it, and the word of God has power. It is very important for us to understand that, to pay careful attention and to know how it works in reality in our lives. So what does it mean? Christ is our foundation. Uh, I do not have time to develop it really well because it, it will require maybe several sermons. But I want to concisely explain how Christ is a foundation, can be a foundation for, for your life. So I put together a list of qualities. And actually, to be... Uh, to be more, uh, more, let's say, uh, um, holy, let's say, I, I chose just seven qualities. I could choose, choose 12, uh, that could be maybe fuller number, or 40, you can speak about Christ, even 70 different qualities, but these seven, I believe these, uh, these are the most important things, things for us to understand that we would see how important it is to rely on Christ. Number one, when we are thinking about Christ, number one, that we need to understand that Christ is a perfect God-man. This is why we can rely on him. What does it mean? If you had been here during the month of January, uh, December, we were talking about Emmanuel, God with us. And I explained it in detail the importance of that approach that God has chosen. There is only one way for God to truly be with man is to be united in, in the person of Christ. God had been with people of Israel. He lived among them, but you know that that did not work. So God has invented, designed completely different ways he is uniting with human being on the personal level in the person of God's Son, Son of God, fully God and fully man, who united in himself God and human. That's why we can rely on Christ. We can rely on Christ because this union is inseparable, this union is eternal, and this union is actually related to us because through faith, we can be united with Christ and in the same way as Christ had that God's nature and human nature. In the very same, name, uh, same way, when we are being born again, that same thing happened, we received divine God's nature, the Holy Spirit comes within our heart and revives our hearts and joins in that inseparable eternal union. And all of that is possible only because of Christ. You know, we're not saved by principles. 
We are not saved by rules. We are not saved by traditions. We are not saved by any actions. We are saved by a person. And that person is Christ Jesus, fully God and fully man. This is why there is no other foundation. So I can rely on Christ. Why? Because in Christ I am sure that nothing will ever separate me from God. In Christ Jesus, I am sure that God loves me in the very same way as he loves his only begotten son, beloved son, Christ Jesus. This is why this is only foundation. This is why we need to rely on that. And if you will rely on something else, you will definitely fail. Then number two, when we think about Christ, we rely on righteous life of Christ. And why is that important? Christ is not just was God who uh, just uh, assumed human flesh and became or became human. But he lived a full human life in an absolute and clear and uh, perfect agreement with his father. You know, our problem, our core problem, is that we are in constant disagreement with the creator. We are at odds with creator. You know, creator has everything moving in certain way. And we, being moral agents, I mean, we think, we desire, we will, we act, we react, we, we have, we generate things. And we are generating things which are constantly going against God. So we are in, not, in, <clears throat> not synchronized with God. God, at a certain point, wants something and we want something slightly different on, or quite often uh, just very different than what he wants. And because of that, we are not in tune with God, we are not in tune with his creation, we are not in tune with his purpose. And that's the problem. That's, that's the problem here on earth because we are experiencing all those uh, problems in life, and there, there's an even bigger problem in eternity because there will be a time when God will just finalize everything and he will take away everyone who is against him. So the only way for a human being to get that perfection, to get that perfect harmony, perfect alignment with the will of God is in, in Christ Jesus. Christ was that perfect human. And that's why it is important that uh, salvation is from fully God and fully, fully man. Because he was a, a real human who lived in his life, his life on earth, but he lived it in full agreement with God, with real God. This is why we can rely on Christ. Because we understand that more you will know Christ, more you will trust Christ, to a greater degree you will live in harmony with God, with the Creator. To better and more fulfilled your life will be just because of Christ. So number three, how Christ is our foundation, is Christ's substitution and sacrifice. We rely on Christ because he took upon himself our sins. And there at the cross, he bore the full punishment that we deserved. And he took it upon himself and he died. He paid the penalty. And he gave us his own absolutely perfect righteousness. Here we, we sin. Here we fail. We, when you look at your own life, you will find it all the time and time again that, yeah, shortcomings here, sins there, rebellion there. Uh, there is not something uh, that you, even you, you satisfied with yourself, and for sure God will not be satisfied with you. But just because Christ had died on our behalf at the cross, 
we can rely on him. And we can be sure that we are sinless, that we are free from guilt, and we are actually accepted by God the Father because of his absolute holy righteousness. This is why there is no other foundation than Christ. Then number four is the resurrection of Christ. When we think about the resurrection of Christ, it demonstrates, it proves actually his victory over sin and Satan. And it's, it proves that uh, one day we will be resurrected as well. This is why Christians do not be afraid to die. Do not afraid to die. Why? Because we rely on Christ. We rely on his death and resurrection. And he died and he rose again. And we who are in Christ, we are sure that we will be raised up one day with Christ. This is what it means to rely on Christ. This is what it means to have Christ as the only foundation. And then we rely on the ascension of Christ. And ascension of Christ is very important because through that, Christ demonstrated that human being actually is able to come up into the glory of heaven and to sit next to, to, to God the Father. So Christ is demonstrating that. He is actually preparing a way for us. And now we can be sure that one day, you and me, everyone who is saved by Christ, will be actually lifted up into the glory of unimaginable glory of God, creator of the universe. That perfection of creator will be actually yours to behold and yours to enjoy and yours actually to share because he will share it with you through Christ. So this is why we rely on Christ. And then number five is Christ's intercessory ministry. We rely on Christ because we know for sure that even when we are here on earth, while we are going through our challenges and we see a lot of difficult problems in our, in our lives, we know for sure that Christ loves us so much that he intercedes on our behalf before the Father, asking him to help, asking him to lead us, asking him to protect us, to make sure that we would be able to to achieve that goal, to come to that destination that he had prepared to us. And then the last one, we rely on Christ because of the promise of the second coming of Christ. You know, at the end of history, all those who are saved by Christ will partake in that marriage supper with him, a full, a full limitless, joyful, majestic, all in all union with the great God, man, the lamb who died for us. So all of those are qualities of Christ that consist of foundation. So this is, this is a foundation. This is what God is saying, I laid the foundation in Zion. That stone that we can rely on. Those people who lived before Christ they just were able to foresee through prophetic words and still rely on it. And now we have it had been fulfilled already. So we relied on what Christ had done. But in addition to that, the prophet calls this stone a cornerstone. Look with me once again to verse 16. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am the one who has laid as a foundation in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone. So the foundation is a one idea. A cornerstone is just a slightly different idea. Why is it different? Uh, to explain it, I, I decided to, uh, to paint a picture. To, to Actually, I did not do that. I asked... Uh, Pasha Stasi, I think he's here or not here. <coughs> Many years ago, he, he put together this picture for me <coughs> when I preached on another passage <coughs> about cornerstone. So this is a cornerstone. 
What does it mean? The cornerstone definitely is the foundation, but it serves not just as a foundation, a strong stone that uh, the whole building will be set upon, but as something that gives direction. You, you see that cornerstone determines this wall, the direction of this wall, direction of this wall, and direction of the whole building when it grows higher and higher. This is why he is calling Christ, Isaiah is calling Christ and promises about Christ as a cornerstone. So Christ is not just a foundation for us. Christ determines how our life should be developing. Direction of our thoughts, our feelings, our desires, our purposes, where our creative power is, uh, is being put to, and directed to. Everything that we produce is determined by that cornerstone. We actually read exactly that in Ephesians 2, verses 19 through 21. Uh, look what Paul is uh, writing here about the cornerstone. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. This is what we see God is doing. So Christ is being a cornerstone. So Jesus Christ determines the way how a church is built. Well, that's a very important thing. When we are talking about Christ in our life, <clears throat> we need to remember that there is nothing more important than influence of Christ in your life in the church. When we come to church, and that's very good that uh, there, there are a lot of very good churches, but we are prone to be drawn to the influence of, of the church or maybe good preachers or maybe some influential people that play an important, played an important role in your life, and that's great. But you need to make sure that not people, even the best people direct the uh, development of your life, that your life is being directed by Christ Jesus. So my job and job of everyone who is here is not to draw your attention to me or our church or the way how we do things, is to draw your attention to Christ Jesus that you personally would know how Christ works, that Christ would direct your thoughts and your desires, and your feelings, and your understanding of life and different things. So that's the purpose. Why? Because this is what the Holy Spirit is being doing. Look, look what he is saying here, verse 22. In him you also are, are being built together into dwelling place for God by, by the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is working within your heart trying to achieve the same thing. He is building you in, according, in accordance with the cornerstone, which is Christ Jesus. So Christ determines the nature and the character of the, of the whole building, and Christ is the meaning of life for those who are saved. So this is one thing that we have discovered here. The cornerstone is a foundation, and it gives direction for our lives, but there are a couple of other qualities which I join together, combine together, and I call them a reliable stone. So first thing, that stone is a foundation, and we already spoke about that, and it, it's a cornerstone. But then he wants us to see that this is a real, real reliable stone. There are a couple of things which are very important. Let me point them out really quickly. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am the one who has laid as a foundation in Zion a stone, a tested stone. So when he is saying that we can rely on those promises, on Christ Jesus, he is saying, 
guys, I have tested that. You know, those things that go into the use, into the you know, commercial uh, production, they had to be tested first. I know several guys who worked, uh, they used to work, maybe even working now, in, uh, I think it is called UL, a uh, company here which is testing different products. Uh, last week we had the uh, privilege to join uh, Jeff and Anna Marie uh, with their last days in NASA. Uh, Jeff actually uh, just retired or about to retire these days and uh, congr congratulations after 40, 40 how many years? 47 years. He served in the military first and then in NASA and uh, he flew to those international uh, space station. And there are a lot of things that had to be tested first before they were put on that plane and before that door would fly away. You probably remember which, which happened just uh, recently. So that's an example which had uh, something that had not be, been tested well enough. So now they are working and trying to find out what they missed there, why they did not test it well enough that that door you remember on, on flight, Alaska flight a couple of weeks ago. But when he is speaking about Christ, he's saying this stone had been tested. And you know what? The reason why we have Bible so thick, because the first two thirds of the Bible explain us how that stone had been tested. Like when, when God had promised Abraham that he will bless him and through him all the nations of the world will be blessed, we see the history of Abraham as a series of tests. And we see that God promised him and Abraham lives and he has a lot of challenges. A lot of different people interfere with that and he actually, at the end, you remember, uh, after long, several decades, he finally gets the son. And then in 13 years, God wants him to, to sacrifice his son. Uh, and, but we see the whole history that God is faithful. And whatever he promised had been fulfilled. Although Abraham had to wander in that land that God had promised, I will give you this land, but that land was never, uh, never belonged to Abraham during his lifetime. And he will say that in 400 years, your descendants, they will come back here. Uh, and you could imagine that, yeah, if, if that's the way, God probably should protect them and make them kind of slow, slowly grow from that one place more and more and more and more and finally you have the whole, whole land. No, God is taking them out, putting him, them in Egypt. In their in Egypt, they grow and they become slaves actually there. And God in a miraculous way takes them, them out of Egypt and brings them back into the promised land just for one purpose, that we would see that the, his word is tested. And then the same way we see with David. God had promised David that he will be king. And then for a number of years, he was running from Saul. Just because, you know, so many enemies. And he, he had experienced a lot of troubles. Even his friends and his relatives failed him. And actually, probably the, the biggest problem was his own weaknesses. But we see that promises of God are sure. And they had been tested. And after the prophet Isaiah, we see that God's promise had been tested and, uh, and proven that, you know, those remnants, they were able to come back to Jerusalem. And what was the most important a test or demonstration of the faithfulness of God's promises? The birth of the Son of God. Full of God and full of man and his righteous life and, and his substitutionary death at the cross and his resurrection and his ascension. 
and, uh, and the Holy Spirit's coming upon this earth, and he's working, building up the church. So this is a tested word. And since he had been faithful to his word for so many thousands of years, actually, we can rely on it. We can trust his word. We can trust that he had forgiven our sins. Why? Because he is faithful. We can trust that we will be resurrected with him. Why? Because he had been t- uh, faithful for so many years. This is what it means, a tested stone. Its, uh, its strength had been demonstrated so many times from different angles so we can be sure in it. But look, one, one more word which is uh, very important here. A tested stone, a precious cornerstone. It's not just a cornerstone. It's a precious because the Messiah is the most precious person in the universe. God who became a man, God who made man perfect by uniting, by uniting man with himself. As I just mentioned, we are not saved by rules or principles. We are saved by a person and that person is a precious person. This is why he wants us to know that. 1 Peter 1, verse 18, <clears throat> we read, Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. You know, every human life is precious. But life of Son of God is much more precious because he is perfect God. Actually, the preciousness of Christ can and should be measured by three, uh, three things. Number one, the value of the Messiah is determined by who he is, God, fully God and fully man. Number two, the value of the Messiah is determined by what he means to God the Father. You remember how many times the scripture uh, says that he is the only begotten son, and then when, whenever God speaks about the Son from heaven, you remember how he describes Son? He is saying, my beloved Son. He wants the whole world to know that he loves the Son, and he loves the Son more than anything else. But there is number three, third dimension of, our, of the value of the Messiah. It's determined by his significance to us. For the believers who have been saved by Christ, who have known freedom from sin in him, who has tasted the beauty of his person, who understand the riches of his love, who know the power of his confidence, Christ is the ultimate treasure. So we receive in him what we cannot obtain anything uh, uh, anywhere else. The first Peter chapter 2 verses 7 and 8 describe it. Unfortunately, ESV does not do a very good job translating this particular phrase, uh, but I will, I will just show you the different ways of translation. So we uh, read in verse 7, So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and the stone of stumbling and a rock of offense and they stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. So ESV translates the Greek word time as honor here. And it can be translated as honor, but there are different ways of translating that. And I think NASB is doing a better job here and Net Bible even better. Look what we see it's in NASB. Uh, this precious value meaning Christ, the value of Christ, then is for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve the stone which the builders reject. And Net Bible translates uh, this way. So you who believe see his value. So those who believe, they see the exceptional value of Christ. But those who do not believe, those people consider Christ as a stumbling block. And actually what Peter is doing here, he is combining 
two different quotes from Isaiah 28 and from Isaiah chapter 8. And he puts them together. And we'll look at them just, just a little bit below. So uh, when, when we read, actually the Russian version, uh, the, the main Russian Bible translation that we have uh, does a very good job here which is, uh, if we can translate it directly, that will be, therefore, he is a treasure or something valuable to those who believe. So Christ will be a treasure for those who believe in him. Believers understand the true value of Jesus Christ. But for those who are not believing in him, he is a stumbling block, and we'll look at that just a little bit later. Look what he is adding to that. He is saying that he is a precious corner. Behold, I am the one who has laid as, as a foundation in Zion, in Zion a stone, a test of stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not be in haste. And we can change that translation again. Haste uh, meaning that... Uh, uh, that somebody who is just uh, not in its place, uh, somebody who is trying to run somewhere, he is not or she is not stable at that point. But, but he's saying of a sure foundation, meaning immovable, firmly set and, set, and you can rely on him and you can be sure. Actually, uh, he is... Uh, <coughs> Uh, the, there are some, some other translations which uh, help us to see that little bit uh, in, in a better uh, picture. The LASB, which is very, LASB Legacy Standard Bible, which came out just last year. A very good translation. <clears throat> it translates it in the following way. Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone for the foundation, firmly placed. He who believes in it will not be disturbed. So we'll be firm, firmly placed. We'll not be moved by something. Uh, when Paul is quoting that in Romans 10, verse 11, he is quoting the same passage, but he puts it in, in a uh, little bit different uh, way. He's saying, for the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. And NASB translate this very verse. Who he believes in him will not be disappointed. So the idea is clear. Then if you believe in, in that foundation, if you rely on Christ, if you learn how to rely on Christ, if you understand what kind of foundation he is for your life, if you will put your weight of life on him, if you learn how to do that, you will not be disturbed. You will not be moved. You will not be ashamed. That's the idea that we see here in this verse. We are actually constantly are tempted to make something or someone else our foundation rather than Jesus Christ. Look at your life now. And probably, most likely, even today, even here, you have something else that draws your attention and you are trying to, trying to rely on something. And I already listed in the beginning of this sermon many different things that play that role in our life. And today, as we begin this year, we need to make sure that our attention is strongly drawn to the Christ Jesus, to the only cornerstone that we have. And we actually could end in this, but there is another idea that we need just briefly touch. This is a rejected stone. It's not just a cornerstone, a reliable stone, but unfortunately, those people who do not believe, they reject this stone. And this idea that we see here, look at verse 12 in chapter 28. He is saying to whom he has said, this is rest, give rest to the weary, and this is repose, yet they will not hear. 
So that's the problem of a lot of human beings that when we hear about Christ, when we see about him being precious cornerstone, firm foundation for our lives, a lot of people, when they come to Christ, they, they see Christ and they reject Christ. And what is he, he is explaining here that it will not go by just the simple and different way. No, no. When you face Christ, and everyone eventually will face Christ, sooner or later, you have to, only two choices. Either you rely on him, or this stone will become a judge for you. Actually, look at verses 16 and 17. He just presented to us this precious cornerstone. And then in verse 17, he says, And I will make justice the line and righteousness the plumb line, and hail will sweep away the re refuge of lies. Waters will overwhelm the shelter. So the Messiah will bring not only salvation, but also judgment. When uh, uh, John the Baptist was preaching, he was presenting Christ. Look how he presented Christ. Uh, Matthew 3, verses 11 and 12. I baptize you with water for repentance, by he who, but he who come, who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winning fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshold floor, rather his wheat, uh, gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So the Jesus is presented as the one, the same Jesus. He takes some people who believe in him, and he baptizes, meaning he is actually immersing. Baptize meaning to be immersed. Immersing someone by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. But others will be immersed into the fire, into the lake of eternal fire, actually. And this is done by Christ. Actually, Jesus himself, when he was presenting him, and he was explaining the same thing. John 5, verses 21, 20, 22, he was saying, for as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to him he will. For the Father judges one not, but he has given all judgment to the Son. So Christ Jesus will save and will judge. In the first Peter chapter uh, 2 verses 6, we already read that, <coughs> speaks about the same thing. For it stands in the scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor or preciousness is for you who believe, but those who do not believe the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, a stone of stumbling and stone of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to. So when we are talking about Christ, Christ came and he offered salvation to Israel, and you know how Israel... Uh, had uh, rejected Christ because they disbelieved. They did not believe in Christ. So as a result, you remember Christ is leaving Jerusalem, Matthew 23, verse 37. We read, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones stone those who are set, sent to him to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hand gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. That's the key word, and you were not willing. And then John describes that in John 1, verses 11. He came to his own, and his own people did not, did not receive him. The reason for rejection of Christ by Jews of the first century was the same as the reason for uh, why people reject God uh, today and during the prophet Isaiah, it's just one reason, it's unbelief. People are not willing to give up their claim on independence. They're not willing to submit their life to Christ. They're not willing to accept that he determines what my life is. And we are trying to 
use Christ to use his resources, to use even his supernatural power to advance our own agenda in life. This is what it means to be rejecting, to reject Christ. In conclusion, I want to return once again to the words of Apostle Paul and uh, Apostle Peter and 1 Peter 2, verses uh, 6 and 7. So honor is for you who believe. And actually, you remember that I put a different translation. So it's a preciousness or treasure for you who believe. And for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected. When you look at these words, answer three questions. Question number one, is Christ Jesus a treasure for you? Or a stumbling block? If Christ is not treasure, you will find something in church, in Christian people, in the Bible, in Christ himself, something that you would try to justify your unbelief. To justify why you're rejecting Christ. And that's very clear. And you will be left without Christ, without that firm foundation. So the question number one, if Jesus Christ has not become a treasure for you, he will be a stumbling block. Number two, if Jesus Christ is not the cornerstone on which your life is built, he will be a rock of offense against which your dreams, your joy, your satisfaction, your life one day will be shattered, definitely. Quite often people think, if I will build my, build my life on Christ Jesus, I will limit myself of those pleasures, of those dreams that I have, and those dreams are outside of Christ. So quite often people want kind of to have both ways at the same time, yeah, I do not want to reject Christ, complete, Christ completely, but I'm not willing, I'm not ready to build my life upon him only. So I am, I'm just keeping in mind Christ, but I am chasing down that dream that I have. You know that, what it means? It means rejecting Christ. And one day, everything that you are after will be shattered. And Christ will make sure that it will happen. For sure. And number three, if Christ has not become your savior, he will be your judge. Definitely. And with these words, I think this is a good opportunity for us to spend some time in prayer. Let us kneel down as we usually do that and take a couple of minutes and think about what we just have heard. And bring it before the Lord and pray about that. And then I will pray at the conclusion. Oh Lord God, we come before your throne first of all with thanksgiving for your such a great love which had been expressed in your son Christ Jesus who became that precious cornerstone, a sure foundation for us. And then know, Lord, that you had done that because this is the only way for us to survive. This is the only way for us to get that fulfilled life, perfect life that you have created us for. Thank you, Lord, for 
providing for us uh, the good news about your son, that now we are part of that salvation, that we, we know your son and we, we can get to know him more and more with every day. Thank you, Lord, for providing the Holy Spirit who works within our hearts, directing us to Christ, pointing us to that preciousness that we have in Christ. And now, Lord, when we are starting this year, we ask your blessing and your guidance for every one of us. I am asking your help for my heart, first of all, and for everyone who is here, for our families. Uh, you know every one of us, and you know how we depend on you. And you know, Lord, that without your Holy Spirit, we, we cannot live here. And we ask that you would direct us over and over again to your Son, that we would learn how to treasure your Son, that your Son would become dear to us, that we would enjoy your Son, that we would see him as the only foundation, practical foundation for everything, and then when everything fails, we can be sure that we stand firmly because your son is immovable. Your son is something that is not breakable by any force here on earth and in, in the universe in general. Lord, help us to be strong in you and help us throughout this year. Help us to be faithful. Help us to find that firm, precious cornerstone and rely on it in every our situation in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.